So we're going to continue our discussion on inventories, and uh, before we go uh, move forward, I'll just briefly summarize the four transactions that we talked about um, yesterday. So um, when inventory is purchased, as you know, you debit purchases, credit cash or AP. Uh, as you sell inventory, obviously you are increasing revenue, so credit sales and debit cash or AR. At the end of the period, what you would do is you would take anything that's in purchases and move that either into cost of goods sold or into inventory. Cost of goods sold is an income statement account and you would uh, move all of that, those purchases into cost of goods sold which have been sold. So debit COGS, credit purchases, and you would take the remaining inventory which has not been sold uh, from purchases and put that into inventory. So debit inventory, credit purchases. Now the question is, what dollar values do you use to put in COGS and inventory and how do you come up with those valuations? So we'll talk about those uh, today. There are four types of valuation methods that uh, exist in accounting um, as far as we're concerned. The first one is the specific identification method or JIT. JIT means just-in-time inventory. Uh, Walmart started this uh, process uh, to, started to use this process in industries which were not car dealerships or house markets. So specific inventory method was originally uh, used by large uh, item industries such as cars and you would know that each car is being sold at one specific point of time. So you would uh, uh, take it out of purchases at that point. However, uh, Walmart revolutionized the market uh, by creating software that would scan products and so on and uh, right away update their inventory systems. So what happens is, <coughs> excuse me, instead of waiting till the end of the period to do debit COGS credit purchases, debit inventory credit purchases, in specific inventory method or GIT, you would do this, these two transactions as you are selling products. Uh, so what will happen is that uh, each item is sold uh, and then you would debit COGS and credit purchase right away for that item. Um, and of course at the end of the year whatever is remaining goes to the inventory account. So it is most frequently used when a company sells a limited variety, but as I said, a limited variety of items, but as I just said, Walmart revolutionized this about 20 years ago and a lot of companies have been using this uh, method. The second method, which is highly used, is FIFO. FIFO stands for, for first in, first out. So what you're assuming here is, again, it's first in, first out. What you're assuming here is that all the products that you have purchased in order for you to sell, uh, you will be basically assuming that anything that you purchased first, you will be selling first. So because what happens is in, in, in times of inflation or regular times, prices go up. So you may purchase a few pens, let's say, for a dollar in order for you to sell them at a dollar fifty. And then a month later, you're purchasing those pens at a dollar or two, and then two months later, a dollar or three, and so on. So you're purchasing them at different prices. However, in FIFO, you're assuming that any product that you purchased at the beginning, you're selling that product as you go through uh, the, 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 the selling cycle. So at the end of the year, all you have remaining is the products that you purchased at the end or near the end of the year. However, physically, you may have sold those pens which you purchased at a dollar or three rather than a dollar, right? However, uh, as I mentioned that on books, you're assuming that you purchased, uh, you sold those products that you purchased right at the beginning. So this is called FIFO. It actually reflects the actual physical flow of inventory <coughs> rather than assumptions. The next method is called AC or average cost. In this method, you take the costs of purchases that you have made 
and you average it out using weights. So if you purchased 100 pens at a dollar and two pens at two dollars, you would add 100 dollars plus four dollars, divide that over 102 pens. So you weighted the average of the, of the cost of the pr products by the number of units you purchased. So average cost assumes that the goods available for sale are the, the same, they're costing you the same, and there's no issues with that. Again, this is used by most companies uh, with a lot of products because it is easier to calculate um, instead of assuming either uh, of the other methods. The last method that you can use is LIFO. LIFO is the opposite of FIFO. In LIFO, you are assuming that anything that you buy last, you are selling first. So LIFO stands for last in, first out. Um, this is not an actual way of uh, flowing products. It does not coincide with the physical flow of inventory and has not been used in Canada for the last several years under any gap, the old or the new, um, and under either the tax system as well. So uh, it is not one of those things that is being used in practice currently in Canada. However, there are countries that allow LIFO. So again, there are four methods. Uh, just in time, which is specific identification method, then there is average cost, and then you have FIFO and LIFO. Uh, there are several effects of valuation methods. Income statement effects include, uh, for example, that in periods of inflation, FIFO reports the highest net income because you are assuming that you are selling the lowest price product first. So your net income obviously goes up. Uh, the LIFO would be the lowest, and AC falls in the middle somewhere. So there are certain effects, of course balance sheet effects as well. FIFO produces the best balance sheet value since the inventory costs are closer to their current or replacement values. Um, just a few formulas that I want to highlight for COGS and inventory. As you can see, COGS is an income statement account. Sales minus COGS equals gross profit. We have talked about this in the past. Gross profit minus expenses equal net income. So these two formulas are really critical for you to understand that the company would like to know how much money they have left over after they've accounted for COGS, that means their gross profit, and then how much money do they have left over after they've accounted for all their expenses, which is net income. COGS can also be calculated using another way uh, you can take the beginning inventory uh, from last, uh, which would be the ending inventory of last year. So beginning inventory of this year, plus all your purchases that you've made minus your ending inventory. This would also give you COGS. And remember EI, ending inventory, is the inventory asset account of balance sheet. So there are some additional notes that you can read um, as you go through. One of the things that I wanted to highlight from, from this slide is that once you've chosen a valuation method, uh, it would be wise to stick with it consistently year after year. Um, otherwise, if, if you, let's say, if there's a company you choose to change it, um, that's fine. You'll have to disclose the effects of the, the new method um, in your notes, and you might have to restate two or three years of financial statements. So it's a lot of work to change uh, valuation methods. Some companies do change um, if there is a definite need for them to change. So moving on to um, a couple of more things, I would like to talk about recording sales and sales returns. I'm sure you've um, heard of sales, obviously, and you might have heard of sales returns as well. So there are times in a company's life uh, that certain customers would like to return their products or services. The question is, how do you record these sales returns? So, obviously, when you are selling goods, you would debit cash, credit sales, or credit revenue. Um, if the customer returns these products or, or services, you would debit uh, sales returns or revenue returns and credit cash. 
So what's happening is, as the customer is returning these products, you are giving them the cash back, so you're crediting cash, and they are returning the products, uh, or the sales is going down, so you debit sales or sales returns. Sales returns or revenue returns is a type of contra revenue account. It is a contra revenue account. It goes uh, in the opposite direction as revenue or sales, um, and that's why you are debiting this. So you can see in this example, the customer has bought $3,000 worth of goods, and then they have returned $300 worth of goods. Now, there is proposed gap measure, um, as far as I remember from a, a year ago, uh, it still has not finalized or materialized yet. Um, so in this proposed gap, what they're proposing is that instead of waiting for the customer to return the product and then debiting sales returns, what they're asking you to do is think about that in advance and assume a percentage of customers, <coughs> excuse me, assume a percentage of your sales will be returned based on your past history. So what's happening here in this proposed transaction is that you're, when you are selling the product, you're debiting cash, of course, as $3,000 as previously, but you're only crediting revenue for $2,700 because in this case, you're assuming that 10% of your products are being returned and this assumption is carried forward from the past. Um, so what happens is you are crediting revenue for $2,700, which is 90% of $3,000, and then you are debiting unearned revenue for the other $300 or 10%. Now it is unearned because initially you have sold the product, but you don't know if this 10% is going to be returned or not. So you are assuming that this 10% may be returned, so that's why you're creating a liability. You're not putting this into revenue at this point. And you see you're creating a liability. At the end of the year, what may happen is that you may have the customer return the $300 worth of goods. You may have customers that re return $200 worth of goods or 400. The 200, 400 are just telling you that it may be less or more than the $300 that you've assumed. Right? It can be any figure, but it can be less or more. So it can be in exactly that 10% that you assumed, or it can be less or more. What happens is that then you would do one of these three transactions. You would either do the 10% or the less or the more that whatever has happened or occurred during uh, at the end of that period. So let's say the customer returns exactly $300 worth of goods. You would debit unearned revenue because now you no longer have that liability and you credit cash for $300. So the liability goes down to zero and the customer gets their $300 worth of money back. And again, if you think about it, revenue is still $2,700 because your assumption was accurate. However, if the customer returns only 200, which is less than 300, you would take out the unearned revenue, you would take out $300 from unearned revenue, meaning you would uh, decrease the liability to zero because now the customer has only returned $200. So that means you've given back the money, credit cash, $200. What happens to the other 100? It becomes your revenue at this point. So you would credit revenue now because customer has been satisfied and they've only returned $200, not $300 worth of goods. And the third scenario is where the customer has returned more goods. So what you would do is you debit unearned revenue 300, which means that you are now decreasing unearned revenue to zero. And then you would take the extra amount and debit revenue directly because obviously the customer has returned some of that goods. And you credit cash for whatever that amount is. In this case, it's $400. So once again, it's one of these three transactions and this is called an adjusting entry, and previously, uh, uh, the previous entry would be called a regular entry uh, if you were to follow this proposed gap. And then, of course, these, one of these three would be called, called an adjusting entry. Under the current gap, 
the sales returns entry is not called an adjusting entry, it is called a regular entry. It's just that it happens only when the customer returns goods. So I'll, 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 I'll let you finish off on the purchase returns concept, which is very similar to the sales returns concept. Um, and you can do that by reading the next couple of slides. Again, remember this is just proposed gap. It is not part of IFRS or ASPE at this point. Um, maybe it will become part of this, uh, part of GAP uh, as we go along. So I just want you to think a bit, to, uh, think about this a bit more and understand uh, these concepts. In your assignment, you will be asked to, to use uh, existing and proposed GAP so you understand the, the purposes and, and, the, the hindsight and the understanding behind those. So thank you for, for watching.